Good morning. My name is Peter Föld, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth International Congress on Arctic Social Sciences, uh, ICAS 9. Uh, this is a great manifestation of Arctic Social Sciences and Humanities, and I am so happy to see all of you here in Umeå. First of all, uh, I want to call to your attention that a conference like this would never happen without a large group of people contributing. And yes, briefly mentioning the organizing committee at the university and the volunteers that are here to assist you. And I certainly hope that you can find a good person to ask if you have any need of assistance. And with that said, I will give the word to my colleague and co-convener, Associate Professor at the Department of Sami Studies here at Umeå University, Krista uh, Stod. Thank you. First of all, I will, I will uh, welcome you to Sápmi, the Sami land. And, uh, for you who don't know that this was not too long ago, the pasture ground of, uh, of two families, Passion and, uh, and uh, Jonsson, who had the reindeer grazing in this area where the university are located today. So uh, to, to then you know, uh, and uh, we respect this area. And, and you see on the logo as well that we have the three reindeers and the reindeer and three reindeer bulls. And that symbol is also from the 1600s. It's really old. Tells us that Sami has been in this area for a long, long time and has met people from this area and have lived together in certain times, mostly in the winter times. So in that respect we, to these families so that, who are still moving very close to this town in the winter time. Umeå University also had their own song, Sami tune, the Joy King, uh, to that was created in 1993. The, maybe uh, some of you uh, know the song from uh, we, we presented it in uh, Prince George 2014. But our Vice Chancellor, I don't think you have ever heard it. So, so I will give this song, that's University Yoik. <laughs> Up me on the west, it is a That's our university service. <laughs> Welcome, Boris Potin. Thank you so much, Chris. That what a good start of the conference. And uh, this is an important manifestation of social sciences and humanities. Uh, and I am convinced that we contribute to show the world that the Arctic is a region with people and places, the theme of the conference. And I'm really grateful that you are all here to contribute to demonstrate the, the broad activity of Arctic research in social sciences and humanities. Um, we have, I should not say been in the shadows, but we are definitely 
taking more place these days than ever before, and we should. With that, I have some just practical information before I will introduce the four welcome talks today. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, we have a reception this evening at 5 o'clock, uh, a 10 minutes walk from here, and if you see color, colored balloons, that is the direction to walk to the reception. And after the reception, there will be buses taking you back to the hotels and to the first camp area as well. I also have greetings. We are many people here, but there are, of course, some people who wanted to be here so much but could not make it in the end. And uh, as they say sometimes, uh, a word from our sponsors. Um, one of the most important contributors to uh, the financials of the Congress, making it possible for 150 people to come here, is the National Science Foundation in the US. Uh, and under directorship of Anna Kurtula, who so much wanted to be here, but for private reasons she could not really, and she sends her regards to you and wishes us a, a really good uh, five days conference here, and reminds us that she will participate during the NSF town hall meeting uh, on Saturday and the Arctic Horizons meeting on Sunday uh, on Skype. So you will have an opportunity to see and listen to her. But regards from Anna Kertula. Uh, I also, I'm aware that there seem to be some connection problems for people with um, Mac iPhones uh, to the Wi-Fi. Uh, people are working on that, and I really hope we can solve it quickly. Good. That is the official opening of ICAS 9. And, uh, we have four prominent persons here to address a welcome to the audience. And first out is the Vice Chancellor of Umeå University, Professor Hans Adolfsson. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that introduction, and thank you very much, Christer, for that joy. It was, it was certainly the first time I heard it. I hope it won't be the last time, so it was very impressive. Thank you. So, dear delegates of the 9th International Congress of Arctic Social Sciences, um, I would like to welcome you to Umeå, to Umeå University, and to Aula Nordica which is this lecture hall. Um, the university here is uh, something that is a, is a, it's a lot, rather large university, and I would like to take the opportunity now to give you a little overview of the university in my opening address here. Of course, I'm very honored to be the first welcome uh, speaker here, and uh, I'm sure the, this meeting with so many delegates from all around the world will be a success. But let me give you a little overview of Umeå University. The university was founded in 1965, um, and uh, that was the official uh, inauguration of the university in, back in that days. But before that, there were some education activities in Umeå, and Back in the 1940s, we also had a dentistry school uh, situated here in Umeå, and that was followed by a medical faculty. And later on, uh, it grew to become a full-scale university with all the different disciplines, as we have today. It's quite interesting to see that the population of Umeå at that time was about 65,000 people. And uh, so, so 65,000 when the university was inaugurated. And at that time, the first year in 1965, the university had 2,000 students. Today, the university has grown quite substantial. And as you can see, we have 32,000 students uh, in total, and about 1,100 of these at the PhD level. Interestingly, the city of Umeå has grown in population as well. So now it's about 120,000 people living here. 
And I don't know if I should say that it's due to the university, but certainly the university has had an impact on the development of Umeå and the region here. That is true. We also have about 4,000 people working at the university, meaning that we are one of the largest employees here at, at either or in this region, in Umeå. We've divided our activities into four different faculties. We have 48 different departments and, or units, 17 research centers, and uh, the turnover of the university is approximately 4.2 billion Swedish crowns per year. As I said, the university is a full-scale university, university with all the different disciplines. We cover everything from education and research in art over to, to uh, professional education on the medical side, that is, educating new doctors and nurses and so on. And of course, we have faculties then for social scientists, for arts, for medicine, and science and technology. And in addition to that, we also have a school of education, which is something that lies basically across the whole university, meaning that we take advantage of the expertise of people working at the different departments for teaching our becoming school teachers as well. With that, we, we have quite a number of re both research programs and, of course, also uh, educational programs. We're situated here in Umeå, uh, mainly at the Umeå campus, where you are right now, where Aula Nordica is situated, but we also have three additional uh, campuses around in this region. We have one additional in Umeå, and that's the one you see on the slide behind me, the Umeå Arts Campus, which is situated very nicely down by the river. Uh, this campus area is uh, a very unique environment, and if you have the chance to visit this, I certainly think you should, because it's really a uh, fantastic place to walk around in, uh, where we have the Umeå School of Architecture, the Umeå School of Art, and the uh, Institute of Design situated there. And also, we have a museum of contemporary art and visual culture, the so-called Bild Museum in Swedish, which is the central building that you see, the tall building in, in the middle there. Uh, it's also a very nice exhibition hall, which is certainly worth visiting once you're here. Um, I should also mention that we have small campus areas up in Skellefteå, which is about 110 kilometers to the north, and in Önsköldsvik, which is a city about 110 kilometers to the south. So that's sort of the coverage of Umeå University. We're a rather international university, so we have people from all over the world working here as both students and as, as uh, staff, so professors and teachers and so on. Umeå University is ranked as one of the best universities in Sweden when it comes to international student satisfaction. This is measured every year in something called the International Student Barometer, and we usually end up on the top ranking of, of these uh, surveys. Uh, we currently have about 1,100 international students that uh, come here every year. And we also have, and that's something that we're very, very glad to say, we have a top-ranked education in industrial design. And this is really a world-class uh, educational program, uh, attracting a lot of international students as well. Of course, the topic of this conference is the Arctic region. And the Arctic region is certainly a very important region with a number of resources, of course, uh, and, and uh, a lot of challenges, I would say. Yesterday, we had a small pre-meeting to this meeting where we had the Ministry of Higher Education and Research here to discuss various aspects of the climate change and climate issues. And of course, the climate is something that affects the northern region very, very hard. If we see temperature increases, that will certainly be affected or, or seen very recent or very early on here in the northern parts. Um, so, so we certainly is interesting in, in having a good understanding of how climate uh, changes will affect us, but also how we can decrease the temperature increase, of course. And with that said, it's of course very sad to hear that the United States under the Trump uh, administration has decided to leave the Paris Agreement on 
uh, on climate change. We also do research, of course, within uh, Umeå University with a, a direction towards the Arctic region. And we have research on all our four different faculties covering different aspects of the Arctic region. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we have created a, an Arctic research center here in Umeå, uh, which is about five years old, and it's uh, headed by Peter Hult. Uh, and that is a, uh, a research center that has about 300 researchers from Umeå University affiliated to that center. So we cover quite a lot of different research aspects here at Umeå University uh, when it comes to, to uh, Arctic research. So with that, <clears throat> I'd like to finish and uh, I would like to, to wish you all a successful meeting, lots of fruitful discussions and a couple of wonderful days here in Umeå and at Umeå University. So, once again, welcome and thank you. You are too fast. I have a small present for you. Um, people ask me, so, so what is the conference about? What should I go and listen to? And I say, it's impossible to say, it's such a lot of things, but one ambition we had from the start was a good contribution from indigenous research, and we have been very successful there. So, uh, as an illustration of indigenous research, and as a proof that the Arctic is not an isolated region, rather the opposite, with connections to all other parts of the world, a result of a Sami, Botswana research project showing how important the indigenous aspect is all over the world. And the Conference Cup. Oh, thank you very much. Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. And it's time for me to welcome the second welcome speaker uh, to the stage. That is Osa Larsson Blind. She is the president of the Sami Council. And uh, the Sami Council is one of the permanent participants at uh, the Arctic Council and plays a very important role of Arctic governance. Please welcome Osa. Thank you, Peter. On behalf of Sami Council, I want to welcome you all to SACMI. It is also a great pleasure for me to welcome you to my home area, Ubmeje, Umeå. I belong to Ran Samerby, one of the reindeer herding communities uh, of this area. And my family have the reindeer winter pastures right outside of Ubmeje, Umeå town. So this is a place very close to my heart. Being a Sami person from a family of reindeer herding, growing up in this very area, I have got the question here. Where are you from? And when my reply is that I'm from here, I'm asked again, uh, well, where are you originally from? And I have to explain about our roots and connections and how and why me and my family belong to these lands. This makes it evident that the Swedish and the Sami culture are quite different in many aspects. And it shows also the need to spread the knowledge and the understanding of both cultures of this area. And I take myself having to connect my people to this place where we belong. Unfortunately, I believe this is not uncommon for indigenous peoples to be alienated to their home, own home lands. Today, however, Ubmeje, Umeå, is recognized as a part of Sápmi. 
and the Sami culture is visible in many ways. And I am proud to see the change and the recent developments here towards better recognition of the presence of the Sami people in the region. And this is mostly due to tireless work by Sami people here in Ugme, reminding everyone of our history and lifting the vivid Sami culture of this area, connecting the people, our people, to the place. On this background, it should be easy to see why the Sami Council chooses to engage in Arctic science, and in particular with the social science conference such as ICAS. We come here with the understanding that knowledge builds societies. The knowledge production that you are all are engaged in builds the societies in which or for whom it is conducted. If we agree that our cultures are different, whose societies is the mainstream or general science and knowledge production building. Science is also vital for the Sami society, and Sami Council finds it very important to also develop Sami research and knowledge institutions that would conduct Sami research. This is essential in developing and presenting relevant knowledge bases for Sami decision makers, so that we together can build the Sami society. But I also find it particularly important to reflect upon the role of the knowledge system that is the foundation of our cultures, which we have relied upon for millennia, long before any Sami had ever thought of being, becoming a scientist. It is the indigenous knowledge that has been and still is the foundation on which our traditional livelihoods, such as reindeer herding, fishing and gathering, are built upon a knowledge closely connecting people and place, and still relevant for our societies. We just have to figure out how to make better use of this unique and central knowledge that is. And there will be a separate session devoted to this tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. And a conference like this is an important arena for learning from each other. Therefore, I am glad to see that there is a strong presence of Sami and other Arctic indigenous researchers and knowledge holders at this conference. We need all of you in the Arctic and in Sápmi to prepare us for a future in which we can expect dramatic change in the environment. Recent climate change predictions indicate that we should prepare our economies, our livelihoods, for a future we don't know, do not yet know. In 30 years, the Arctic might be very different from the Arctic we know today. And to make the best possible decisions for coping with these changes, we need best available knowledge, both science and indigenous knowledge. And we need to explore ways to co-produce knowledge to benefit all societies, so no one needs to feel alienated in their homelands, at least not due to lack of better knowledge. And at last, I want to wish you all a successful conference. I wish all of you many good and enriching discussions. And remember, keep your minds open for new insights from all various perspectives. Thank you. Basana Borto med ett häftigt omslag och påsan. Thank you so much, Åsa. Six years ago, Sweden took over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. That was in 2011. Just months before, we produced our first Arctic strategy plan as the last of the eight Arctic countries. Perhaps an illustration that we were a bit slow in the Arctic context, but we are not anymore. 2011 was 
a break, a new start of Swedish Arctic activities in politics, in governance, and definitely in research. And uh, I'm really happy to see all the development that has been after that. After Sweden, Canada overtook the chairmanship, and after them, the US. And in Fairbanks, just a month or so ago, it was Finland's turn to enter the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, and uh, I must say that they have already impressed me a lot with their preparations and ambitions for the chairmanship. And I look forward to the forthcoming two years. And I'm equally happy to welcome Arctic senior official, or as we say in Sweden, the Arctic ambassador of Finland, uh, René Söderman. Welcome. Thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, besta vänner, tack för den otroligt fina chansen att få komma hit till Umeå. And thank you for the kind invitation to this ICAS uh, conference. I was very happy to receive the invitation early this year, and I immediately said yes. So uh, being here at the Arctic Social Sciences Conference, this is just a very important part of the big puzzle that we call the Arctic change. But let me be politically correct in the beginning and say a few words of praise to the city of Umeå. This is my first visit to Umeå, and to be honest, you have at least two things to brag about. They are, li uh, they are linked to literature and, and music and arts. One of the most read Swedish contemporary author, authors, Lars Widding, was from Umeå. On my recent travels to Alaska and China, I, I have been reading his historic novels depicting the lives and adventures of cavalry captain Pielfeldt, the cornet Wild och Ur, and of course, King Karl XII of Sweden. Lars Widen takes you on a time travel to Sweden, to Russia, to Denmark, and even to Turkey. Yes, Turkey, that's where the Swedish king was residing for four years after a defeat in Poltava in 1709. Very much worth reading. But what is the other thing to brag about here in Umeå? Well, there's the Guitar Museum. <laughs> I hear it's the world's finest collection of vintage guitars. So, I mean, if, you're, uh, if you know the brands Gibson, Rickenbacker, Gretsch, or Fender, that's the place to be for, for you or any wannabe rock and roll star. And yes, I will be going there this afternoon. But dear friends, climate change. The effects of climate change are already evi evident. Skyrock skyrocketing temperatures are altering the landscape. The, sea on, the ice on sea and land is melting, altering the ocean circulation and also dissolving permafrost. Greenland is just one example. There the ice sheet is disintegrating, the meltwater is filling the depressions, the water is flowing to the edge of the ice sheet and then into the ocean. All this we can see with our own eyes. During the previous presidency in the US, Barack Obama made climate change a top priority because, as he said, of all challenges we face, climate change is the one that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other issue we have at hand. No nation, large or small, rich or poor, will be immune from the impacts of climate change. Now, as mentioned, now as the current US administration has decided to pull out from the Paris Agreement, you probably wonder how will it affect the global work in mitigating and adapting to climate change. Well. I think the global community will work even harder to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. The European Union will have to take a leading role in global climate policy. Both India and China are also grouping together. And as we have seen so far, there are several cities and states in the US 
that are committed to combat climate change. Only yesterday we heard that the state of Hawaii has passed legislation to meet, to meet the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Because climate change is real and denial is not the answer. We have to remember climate change is also an economic opportunity. Economic opportunity when it comes to clean energy, efficient energy. Wind, solar, and sea wave technologies will eventually defeat fossil-based fuels. When we, and I mean when we as government officials, when we talk about Arctic, we often talk about the loss of ice, migratory birds, and the risk of oil spills. Less often, we talk about the people. We tend to forget that it is a home for four million people. Many different peoples inhabit the Arctic region, both indigenous peoples and other Arctic residents. Their voices are important. Therefore, I applaud the work that you are doing in carrying out Arctic social sciences. Through the work of the International Arctic Social Sciences Association and its affiliated institutions, you are able to enhance human capacity, promote vital communities and sustainable development. The international community adopted the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. It was an important step in both promoting and achieving the targets of sustainable development. But I think it goes without saying that without achieving the targets for climate action, it will be very hard to achieve any other sustainable development targets. So we need to continue, continue working hard and with ambition. Many of the sustainable development goals are linked to social sciences. Quality education, gender equality, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production. They are just a few areas where social sciences is making a difference. Dear friends, work on climate change and sustainable development goals are interlinked. You cannot achieve the one without the other. This is why these two make up the cornerstones of the Finnish chairmanship in the Arctic Council. On the regional level, we can work together to strengthen resilience of northern communities and to raise awareness of Arctic issues in global climate talks. The Finnish chairmanship is a two-year-long journey. We take it together with the member states, the permanent participants, observers, and with you as scholars and scientists. Two years is a fairly long period if you compare it, for example, with the presidency of the European Union, which is only six months. But if you compare the Arctic chairmanship with the long 10,000-year history of the Arctic, it is just a blink of an eye. So if it's just a blink of an eye, how, we, how are we going to make the best use of it? Now I could obviously go on talking about and presenting the priorities of the Finnish chairmanship program, but I'm tempted to ask actually two questions. Questions that might help us define where we are and where we want to go. So my first question would be, what is the Arctic we want in the future? From a natural science point of view, we need an Arctic that is able to function as a stabilizer of global, global climate and weather conditions. It is not a doomsday prediction, but the future of our planet is linked to the future of the Arctic. My second question would be, what kind of future do we want for the Arctic? And from a social science point of view, I think we need a future where people are able to live, work, and prosper in the Arctic. It is just as simple as that. The Arctic Council is very well aware of these questions. At the ministerial held in Fairbanks in May, the ministers, and I quote, recognized that the Arctic Council needs to evolve, respond to new opportunities and challenges in the Arctic, and they instruct the senior Arctic officials to develop a strategic plan, unquote. So, a long-term strategic plan 
is some of the things that we will be working on during the next two years. Finally, I would like to say that Arctic cooperation is dependent, dependent on the input of all stakeholders, the member states, observers, per permanent participants, US scientists and scholars. We want to promote Arctic cooperation because that is the key to build a trust among the states, the permanent participants and observers. We want to work with environmental protection because preventing environmental hazards is cheaper than cleaning up after an oil spill. And we want to promote sustainable development because vital communities is the key to resilient communities. So finally, I would like to thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. And you will not receive the Sami Botswana book. I have a teaser for you. 100 cult guitars. <laughs> and a cup. Yeah, we all have our interests. Uh, I used to show the vinyl records I have found in Fairbanks and Yellowknife and different places to René and have his approval that my taste is good enough. <laughs> the fourth welcome speaker is Andres Jato, the senior Arctic official of Sweden since two years back. Yeah. And Andres has showed a true dedication to the Arctic affairs. And as an observer uh, representing IASA at the Arctic Council meetings, I have seen how the voice of Sweden has been shaped. And uh, I also know that Andres is very concerned about the northern region in Sweden and to have us included in the Arctic work and not least Arctic research. And I'm really happy to welcome you to the stage, Andres. Welcome. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to Vesterbot and to SAP me to UMU and its university, which uh, I see as a gateway, the intellectual gateway to, to the Arctic. I think what you are doing here, all of you, uh, is probably more relevant uh, than ever before. Uh, trying to better understand this region, how it develops and evolves, and the role of people and societies is in, in, in this increasingly complex context is necessary if we, are go if we are going to be able to respond properly to present and future challenges. I'm going to try to give you a brief but broad picture of Swedish uh, Arctic policy. And let me start by quoting our foreign minister who said uh, a couple of months ago uh, at a conference in Tromsø the following. She said, the Arctic uh, has in the past been considered a periphery by many. This is now far from being true. Global developments have put the region at the center of international attention. When we're dealing with the Arctic of today, we're dealing with high politics in the true sense of the word. The reasons are primarily climate change, the vast economic potential in the Arctic, as well as security-related developments globally. I believe that this quote catches well the development of Swedish Arctic policy in the sense that, first of all, the region is becoming more important even for Sweden. It's no longer low politics, it's high politics also for us. And two, uh, the challenges and opportunities in the Arctic are truly multidimensional 
which underlines the importance of a broad and at the same time coherent Arctic policy. We must be able to focus on climate, regional, and social, regional economic and social development, security policy, and research at the same time, and in ways which mutually reinforces these different fields. That's where we stand today, and that's what we are trying to do. A close cooperation and dialogue with uh, the research community is necessary. We, the policymakers, can't make it without you. As we all know, the Arctic is the epicenter of the global uh, climate crisis. Last year, a new alarming record was set when the average November ice approached 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial levels. The limits set out in the Paris Agreement have thus partially already been reached in this part of the world. And compared to 2006, the November ice has shrunk with 800,000 square kilometers, the size of two Sweden. I could continue to give you more examples, like pointing at those days last year when the temperature in part of the Arctic approached 20 degrees above normal levels. But we don't need more examples, and the scientific findings are robust enough to conclude that, the cri that a climate crisis in the Arctic is not a future scenario. It's going on as we speak. So let me be clear. Global warming and its effect on the Arctic is not only a potential environmental an ecological disaster, it could also very well develop into a security threat of glo global proportions. We must therefore step up our ambitions to combat climate change at all possible levels. We don't have any other choice but to embark on a paradigm shift in the development of societies and in our aspiration for providing good life, not only for ourselves, but also for future generations. This broad goal is the core at our, uh, for our uh, Arctic policy. The decision by the US administration to withdraw from the Paris Agreement is regrettable and truly irresponsible. President Trump has chosen to place the United States at the wrong side of history. This will make it even more important that countries, including Arctic countries, pursuing a progressive climate agenda cooperate even closer together. We need to create new alliances. I hope, for example, that we will be able to cooperate more with Asian countries like Japan, India, China, South Korea uh, in this uh, existential challenge. At the same time, the people in the North, including the indigenous peoples, have the same right to economic and social development as the rest of our countries. It is crucial, however, that this development is sustainable. To support innovations in green technology and the use of best practices throughout the production cycle is therefore, therefore essential. In this respect, I'm personally rather optimistic. I think that we might have reached at the point where there is a business case for sustainable solutions, at least in many, many sectors. Reopening coal mines belong to the past. Producing steel without CO2 emissions, as done by our largest steel manufacturing company, Sasabe, is the future. We must create proper incentives to strengthen this trend further. And I'm convinced that Sweden with its highly innovative Arctic regions uh, have a great possibility to assume global leadership in this respect. In this context, I warmly welcome Norrbotten, our most northern region, uh, and its development of its own Arctic strategy, which, fo which focuses precisely on these issues. I also welcome the work done here in Vesterbotten, not least at this university. I think in this specific context, you, all of you, uh, and your work is crucial. 
we need to better understand the interface between a rapidly changing nature and the needs of people and societies. The Arctic is not a huge natural museum. It is primarily about people. This is sometimes forgotten and not always well understood. And it's your task to make this understood. Uh, in addition, it seems unfortunately that we're uh, partially at least living in a post-truth era with alternative fact and, and rather distorted views of the world. The importance of science and evidence-based evidence policies have never been more important. Sweden has a strong and I would say impressive tradition when it comes to polar and Arctic research. The Swedish government will further increase its commitments to climate-related research in the Arctic, including through continuous uh, investments in the icebreaker Uden and in our research station in Nobisko. But I think the time has also come to step up our ambi ambitions when it comes to social sciences in this specific Arctic context. Uh, and this conference is an important step in that direction. Thank you very much, and good luck.